Okay, good. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Game plan for tonight is to wrap up chapter three. Okay, and you're seeing that I'm posting the lectures there. So I'll probably end up putting, um, I'll end up put three of the chapter three lecture here, or if it, uh, since we'll get into chapter four tonight, I uh, may put it down here, I don't know. So look for the rest of chapter three and the start of chapter four, wherever I end up posting them. We're not gonna post them twice, okay? And you'll be able to find the whole discussion. So we will get into uh, chapter four tonight as well, okay? But um, let me go ahead and stick this in tablet mode. And um, my recollection is that we are on chapter three, module six, dealing with non-monetary transactions, okay? And this is an area that I wanna spend some time, though I didn't wanna rush last time to try to get through this because this is an area where the examiners do tend to ask questions that can get a little bit complex. So I wanna make sure that you have some practice with this and going over these with me. Also, um, you could get a task-based simulation in which they will ask you to uh, prepare some journal entries uh, dealing with a non-monetary transaction. Okay, so it's important that we look at the journal entries that were here that are here as well. Now, when we look at non-monetary transactions, essentially what we're saying there is, look, the big part of the transaction is not so much an exchange of cash as it is an exchange of equipment for equipment or exchange of equipment for a building, that sort of thing is the major driver in that exchange. And when you start having those type of exchanges, the big deal is going to be, well, when do you recognize a gain or loss on that kind of exchange? And so in determining the recognition of gain, of law, gain or loss, what FASB did was they looked at these transactions of this nature and grouped them into two large categories, those that have commercial substance and those that lack commercial substance, okay? And so we're gonna look at them in those two broad categories, the transaction having commercial substance versus one that doesn't. So one of the first things we're gonna have to know is, well, what is the criteria to determine if a transaction has a commercial substance or not? And they tell us an exchange has commercial substance if cash flows will change significantly as a result of the transaction. And let's flashcard that, okay? And when you look at CPA questions, they'll either just come right out and tell you the transaction has commercial substance, or they'll say to you, cash flows will change significantly as a result of the transaction. Now, again, IFRS isn't gonna be tested after July, but I think it's worth noting here that for IFRS, they tell us that a transaction has commercial substance, a non-monetary transaction has commercial substance, if the exchange has been for dissimilar assets, okay? Dissimilar assets, meaning I've traded buildings for cars. And when you think about that, that's really not that much different than what the US gap rule is because the cash flows that you generate off of a fleet of cars are gonna be different than the cash flows that you generate off of say a building, right? Fleet of cars might last you three years, building might last you for 50 years, right? So it shouldn't shock us that um, you know IFRS is saying dissimilar assets, okay? Now I have seen questions where they're talking about US GAAP and they don't say anything about the cash flows and they don't tell you if the transaction has commercial substance or not. You shouldn't run into those questions. The examiner should have weeded all those out by now. But if you run into something stupid like that, just go with the similar versus dissimilar asset rule, okay? Which is if it's dissimilar asset, then you can assume the transaction has commercial substance. If it's similar asset, then we'll say that the transaction lacks commercial substance. And we'll get to that discussion here in a couple of minutes. Right now, focusing on transactions that what? That have commercial substance, okay? Now, come over 
and they tell us, well, if a com transaction has commercial substance, and you should recognize gains. <laughs> I didn't highlight losses there at first, or I'm using a different color for losses anyway, because you always take losses. There is no situation in which GAP tells you, well, you don't have to recognize the loss for this, okay? When you sell an asset for less than its book value exchange, and you have an asset that you're getting rid of, and its book value is below its fair market value, you will always take losses, always take losses, okay? The question is gains. And if a transaction has commercial substance, easy enough, take the gain, okay? So flashcard that the transaction has commercial substance, you will always recognize the gain on that, okay? Now, let's just take a look here at this example and see how we will calculate that gain. And basically the gain is going to be the difference between the fair value of whatever you're getting rid of and the book value of whatever you're getting rid of. So in this example, the company is exchanging cars for a building. Okay, let's just get the facts in our head a little bit. Um, and the future cash flows will significantly change. Thank you. Both bases were touched there. Dissimilar assets, cars for building, and they told us right out that the cash flows will change. The book value of the cars is 40,000, which is this 102,000 original cost minus the 62,000 accumulated depreciation. That gives me the book value for the cars. And they tell us the car's fair value is 45,000. And they're going to go ahead and pay cash of 20,000, okay? Now, the first thing we're going to do here is calculate the gain. And what I want you to do with this example guys is flashcard these facts i know you're like john i'm gonna get writer's cramp with all these flashcards okay flashcard these facts all right and it's gonna be good for the next three things that we ask you for here so you only got to write the facts once and then i want you to be able from memory to do what the required is on these next three examples okay so this first one they're just telling me calculate the gain or loss and you can see well, they don't say gain or loss. CPA exam questions tend to say gain or loss. And they want to see if you know how to, what you're doing. But we take the fair value of the cars versus the book value. That difference is the gain. Okay, that's the same thing every time, guys, for transactions that have commercial substance. We're going to recognize the gain, fair value versus book value. Okay, that's all that's happening there. Okay, now you come over to the next page. And the next page says, calculate the basis. The next example two now says, calculate the basis of the new building and prepare the journal entry. So you don't have to rewrite the facts, but you should be able to do the next two requireds here from memory, okay? Now, I'm going to give you a flashcard and you should always use this approach to figure out the recorded value of the new asset, right? Got to bring that new asset onto the books. Do it this way every single time. Ready? And this is the flashcard. Go ahead and write. The recorded value of the new asset equals, okay, and I know the book said something else up there and I'm not looking at that. I want you to do it this way. The recorded value of the new asset equals book value of assets surrendered, assets surrendered, meaning the assets you gave up, plus any gain or minus any loss recognized. Can't be both. It's either a, a gain or a loss. Okay, and I'm squeezing that in, so I'm gonna read it back to you, okay? The recorded flashcard, the record, and you know, on the flashcard you say, how do you calculate the recorded value of the new asset? And the answer is what the recorded value of the new asset equals book value of assets surrendered plus any gain or minus any loss. 
Okay. Now let's think through that for this particular example. What was the book value of the cars? Book value of the cars was what? 40,000, right? 40. Okay, good. What was the book value of the cash? I'll just put cars here. They paid cash, didn't they? 20. Huh? 20,000. Good. Okay, cash is easy. The book value of the cash was 20,000. Did they recognize any gain? What was the gain? 5,000. Is was it 5,000 in this example? Yeah. 5,000. Good. Gain was 5,000. Did my flashcard work? The building should be recorded at what? 65,000. Is that what they did for the journal entry? That is also going to be part of what you're going to have to flashcard here. Okay. You're going to have to flashcard how to do the journal entry. So you'd write on the blank side what you want yourself to be able to do, calculate the value of the building, give the journal entry, and then the answer will be what's shown here in the book, but you should be able to do it from memory, or maybe you bust out a piece of paper and you write it down as to what it is you're supposed to do. In other words, we're going to put a mini simulation, because again, I have had dreams that they've had simulation where they make you do these journal entries, you're going to have a mini simulation right inside of your flashcards for this, right? Okay, now, any question on that? Now, if they ask you to make this journal entry or when you're doing it in your practice with your flashcards, okay, I want you to do the journal entry a certain way. Sometimes what happens is we're sitting there and say, well, we have to put the debits first and you're thinking, okay, I wanna put building first. You can't think of what you're supposed to put for the building and you sit there and your mind goes to blank, right? Meanwhile, if they're asking you this in the format of a task-based simulation, you can get credit for the parts of the journal entry you can think of. And if you can figure out everything but one, then you can just you know back into what that last line item should be, okay? So, or maybe you can think of the accounts, but you can't think of the numbers, partial credit, partial credit, partial credit, okay? But let's just go ahead and see how I'm suggesting you should put this journal entry together. So the first thing I would do, number one, is I would credit the cars for the original cost of the cars, because I know I'm getting rid of them. The next thing I would do is debit the accumulated depreciation, because I know that I have to get rid of the accumulated depreciation associated with those vehicles that I'm getting rid of. Number three, I would go ahead and credit the cash. Maybe some people would argue start with that one because you know you're paying cash, you gotta credit it. Number four would be to go ahead and credit the gain. Of course, if it was a loss, you would debit it, but since this was a gain, credit the gain. And then the fifth one of this journal entry, the last line of this journal entry, would be to bring in the buildings. Now, um, I tell you to put your journal entry together that way in case they're asking you for the journal entry. You say, well, if that's the case and I'm gonna do the journal entry last, why do I need this big long flashcard over here telling me how to determine the value of the new asset? Because I don't want you to have to do a whole journal entry and maybe which they don't give you all the elements of the journal entry to be able to um, you know, answer a question where they're just asking you same multiple choice question where they're just asking you the value of the building. Question. Okay, good. So let's come over then and let's just take a look at what happens if it's a loss. Okay, and let's go ahead and let's try our little uh, uh, maneuver here, our flashcard instruction here, which is what book value of the asset surrendered was the cars for 40,000, the cash for 20,000, but now we have what? Well, now we have to go ahead and calculate the loss. And in this case, they're telling me that the um, cars have a book value, uh, excuse me, a fair value of 38, fair value is 38. And we know that the book value, because they didn't change, and you could flashcard this one too, this example too. We know that the book value was 
40,000. So we've got what? We've got a $2,000 now to loss because the fair value is below the book value. So the flashcard tells me we'll then subtract the loss. And when I do, I get 58,000. Right. And then again, you could continue with the one, two, three, four, or five on the journal entry. Okay. Question. All right, good. Let's come over then. And uh, that's fairly straightforward. Um, this is the rule for IFRS. Okay. Up here where they say, look, um, under IFRS, let transaction lacks commercial substance, has commercial substance if the assets are dissimilar, lacks commercial substance if the assets are similar. Did I say the same thing twice? Slow down, John. IFRS says that the transaction has commercial substance if the assets are dissimilar. It lacks commercial substance if the assets are similar. Okay, now for US GAAP, they say if projected cash flows are not expected to change significantly, then the transaction um, lacks commercial substance. Okay, or the problem will say that, or it will just say to you, hey, it lacks commercial substance, or it's going to be what? Similar assets. So now instead of trading cars for building, it's going to be cars for cars, building for building, machine for machine. Okay. Now we always recognize losses, always recognize losses. I don't know if they say anything about losses here. I'm just going to remind you again. I don't care if the transaction has commercial substance or not always recognize what losses always okay the question is the gain what do i do if i have a gain okay now if there is no boot what is boot cash okay if there is no cash in the transaction, no gain. No cash, no gain. You can flashcard that. If there's no cash in the transaction, no gain. Nobody takes a gain. No cash, no gain. Okay. Now, what happens if there starts to be cash involved in the transaction? Okay. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to start. There's the rule about losses. Always, always recognize losses. I can't, I wasn't sure where it was, but always recognize the entire loss. Okay. I, I'm not going to ask you to flashcard that. You know that. Okay. Now, what happens with gains now? That's where we are in this section right here. Okay. What happens with gains now? And what happens with gains uh, when cash starts being involved, okay? And they tell us that if the boot, which is cash, is more than 25% of the total consideration, both parties, both the receiver of the cash and the payer of the cash will, re, uh, will recognize the entire gain. I don't wanna highlight losses because you always take losses. Okay, let me repeat that. If there's cash involved and the cash is greater than equals or exceeds, hopefully questions won't have you right on the edge of the 25%, equal or exceeds 25%, equal or exceed 25%, both parties take the entire game. With me so far? Okay. Now, if the boot is less than 25% of the total consideration, okay? Uh, then the person paying the cash will not recognize the gain. Okay, so cash gets involved. We gotta start thinking about the gain. If the cash is 
equal to or more than 25% of the total consideration, don't worry about it. Everybody takes the full gain. If the cash falls to less than 25% of the total consideration, the person paying the boot, paying the cash, will not take any gain. But the person receiving the cash, the entity receiving the cash, okay, when it's less than 25%, will take a proportional gain. And the proportional gain is going to be equal to the ratio between the cash to the total consideration received. And that ratio will have the cash in the numerator. In the denominator, it'll be the cash plus whatever else was included in that transaction, whatever the piece of equipment was, whatever. And if that ratio is what? If that ratio is less than 25%, then the person receiving the cash will take that portion of the gain. If that ratio is more than 25%, both parties take the gain. If the ratio is less than 25%, the person paying the cash takes no gain on that. And if there's no cash, no gain. Question. Notice the flashcards, guys. You start getting into crap like this, that's a sea of flashcards, okay? Don't underestimate how easy it is to forget stuff like this. But if you've got the flashcards, you will look at this stuff the night before your exam because you're going to be looking at your flashcards. Some people say, I see people say, oh, yes, the two or three days before the exam, you should go walk in the park and look at the birds. And unless those birds are flying behind you saying, if the cash is less than 25%, then you don't go to the park and look at the birds. You need to keep looking at those flashcards. When you go to a sporting event, the athlete, you are the athlete here, isn't laying on the court smoking a cigarette before the game. They're what? They're practicing up into the last minute. I don't want you working a bunch of detailed problems the night before the exam, but I do want you staying loose with your flashcards. Okay. Any question on this? All right, good. Let's go over them and let's look at the example and let's see how we'll apply these rules for transactions that lack commercial substance. Okay. So we're going to see how we're going to be treating the situation with no cash, cash paid, cash received, cash less than 25%, all that, okay? But the other important takeaway is let's see how that flashcard that I gave you about how to calculate the uh, value of the new equipment, what it should be recorded at, uh, how that rule will hold, okay? It'll hold throughout these examples. So I only had you flashcard that once back in the uh, having commercial substance section that flashcard works regardless of whether the transaction has commercial substance or not, okay? So let's just go ahead though, and let's take a look at these examples. And machine A is exchanged for machine B. Machine A has a carrying value of 10, and machine A has a fair value of 12. Now they tell me that machine B has a fair value of 12. Did they have to tell me that? Did they have to tell me the machine B has a fair value of 12? They did not. On the CPA exam, we assume that nobody's getting took. Okay, nobody is getting took on the CPA exam. So, you know, why would a fool give up a machine that has a fair value of 12,000 for machine B that has a fair value of what? 2,000? I mean, no, there's nobody is smoking crack. Nobody got drunk and made a mistake on the CPA exam. If you gave up a machine that had 12,000, then you better get back a machine that has a fair value of 12,000. So don't get confused if you ever run into a problem where they don't tell you the fair value of the item that's being received. Just look at the fair value of the items that are being given up. That's the fair value of what's being received, okay? All right, now, there's a $2,000 implied gain here because machine A's fair value is 12 and machine A's book value is 10. That's how we calculate the gain. But should we take that gain? Answer is what? No, because there is no boot. There's no boot involved in this transaction. There's no gain, right? Okay, now, how about what we should bring on the new asset? How should we bring the new asset on the books? And the answer is what? 
book value of asset surrendered, asset surrendered was A, it had a book value of 10. So I bring the new machine on with a book value of 10. What happens if I sell that machine B the next day? How much should I be able to sell it for the next day? How much should I be able to sell the machine for the same day? 12,000. 12,000, good. And so that same day, whatever, minutes later, whatever you want to look at, assuming I didn't, you know, drop the machine or something, I would be able to debit cash for 12, credit machine B for what? For 10. And now I can take the gain. Hey, even though it's not falling in context of a non monetary transaction at that point, notice cash flows did change. I turned a machine, machine A, into what? into cash essentially in that situation though cash flows have changed and so i go ahead and i take the entire gain at that time okay but right now when there's been no cash involved no cash no gain in a transaction that lacks commercial substance okay okay good now i go ahead and i am going to pay boot okay and i kind of don't like these um headings because it's kind of like a movie that says the hero dies you know at the end how horrible would titanic be if they say you know, the uh, what's his name leonardo DiCaprio dies right we're taking all the steam out of the movie right okay so what happens they're telling you the outcome but let's see if we can go through together and figure out you know what's going on with the uh transaction whether or not we should take a gain or not okay and so it happens machine a and 2500 is exchanged for machine b machine a's book value is 10 its fair value is 12 and machine b has a fair value of 14 did they have to tell me that no how about if i figured it out Say they left that out. I'm not going to cross it out, but say they cross, say they didn't give me that. Fair value plus the cash given. Good. Well, machine A's fair value, very good, was what? 12. And I also had to do what? Give cash of 2,000, didn't I? So why would I do that unless machine B was worth what? Uh, what was it, 2,500? Unless machine B was worth 14.5, right? Good. Okay. All right. So now they want me to uh, figure out what's going on here with this. And um, you come over to the next page. And I'm going to assume that I would have had to make the journal entry for this. And so what happens? Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see that $2,500 cash was involved in this deal, wasn't it? Okay. And then I had this machine A had a fair value of 12 and machine, I mean, not machine, but in the cash had a fair value is the same as its um, book value, of course, of 2,500, didn't I? That was the cash. So what do you get if you take 2,500 and divide it by 14.5, anybody? 17%. Roughly 17%, good. So I'm what? I'm under the 25%, right? But I paid the cash. So since I'm under the 25% and I paid the cash, no gain, right? Now I just go ahead and I make the journal entry and it should be a piece of cake for us, which is to do what? Credit the cash for the cash that you just gave up. Take the machine off at the book value. Guys, they're not calling out the accumulated depreciation to me in these examples, but to take the book value off, I'd have to credit the original cost debit the accumulated depreciation, right? To get that book value off the books. And then what's our flashcard for the value of the new asset? to recording the value of the old asset. It is what? Book value of asset surrendered. So I gave up what? I gave up 10, uh, machine A, which was 10,000. 
and I gave up cash that had a book value of how much? 2500 did it work rule still works this is the kind of thing we want to try to do where we can we can't always do this but if we can come up with one flash card that kind of helps you out with nonsense like this where you've got these different rules flying around uh for you know you can boil that down for non-monetary transaction that one flash card for the new machine that's what you want to do okay Okay, good. So now we're going to see, well, what happens if cash is received? Now, if cash is received, if it's what? If it's equal to or more than 25%, I'll take the entire gain. In fact, if it's, I should say that more carefully, if it's 25% or more, both parties take the entire gain, right? And um, here though, cash is received, and we're going to see, now I'm blowing, now I'm, you know, what do they call that when you alert, when you're gonna spoiler alert? You know, I'm gonna spoil the ending here for you. We're gonna see that the um, cash received is less than 25%, but since we're receiving cash, we'll take a proportional gain, okay? And so let's just walk through that. So machine A is exchanged for what? For, um, machine B and now we're receiving 2,500. Sometimes I get annoyed at CPA questions because they kind of do it like this where they make it kind of, they play hide and seek with whether you receive the cash or you paid the cash and that just bugs me. Look, if you're an entity, you know if you're receiving cash, it's not a secret. Okay, so they should be more, more clear sometimes. So you might have to get used to that a little bit in the funky way they write the questions sometimes just to confuse you. Meanwhile, what's the point of that? If this was the real situation, I would know if I received cash, okay? But then what happened? Machine A has a carrying amount of 10, has a fair value of 12, so we're thinking, uh-oh, there's a potential gain here of two, right? Okay, and I'm receiving cash, so I know I'm gonna take some of that gain, okay? And then machine B has a fair value of 95. Did they have to tell me that? If machine A has a fair value of what? Of uh, 12, and I'm not gonna give you this machine unless you hand me what? 2,500 bucks, that means that I'm saying machine B is worth what? 9,500, right? I got a machine sitting here and you say, oh, I love that. I want that machine. I say, this machine? Well, what are you gonna give me? And you say, well, I'll give you this machine. I'll, Ugh. No, I don't know. That's not fair. I'll, look, I'll give you this if you give me 2,500. That means that what you're giving me is only worth 9,500, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, we want to see how much of that gain we should take, right? So what are we going to do? Well, now the consideration involved is this, what, 2,500 cash. And then it's what? It's the 9,500 for the machine um, B plus the cash. Okay. And uh, you can see that kind of added up here, which is 2,500 divided by 12,000. That's 21%, isn't it? Right, just using their calculation. So that means that I can take 21% of that gain as the entity that received the cash. Now, you go ahead and you look at the journal entry, okay? And for this journal entry, one, since you know that you're getting rid of the machine, you take it off at book value. The next thing I would do is debit that cash. You know you're receiving cash. I just calculated the gain and I don't like that they put plug there, okay? We can still use our flashcard to figure out where we should bring the new machine on and we're just gonna have to think through that process a little bit more. So it's book value of assets given up, isn't it? Okay, now what did I give up? Well, I gave up machine A 
and it had a book value of 10, didn't it? But then what happened? The way I like to think of this is, yeah, but I didn't really give up the full book value of that machine A at 10,000 because I really sold part of it for cash. So when you really look at it, what I did was I gave up what? I gave up 7,500 of the book value of that asset because I took some cash back. So I turned part of it to cash and then I gave up the remaining 7,500 Rule is book value of asset surrendered plus what? Plus the gain. The gain is 417.7917. Is that what they told you to plug there? Okay. So you could have figured it out without doing the whole journal entry by following that rule, that flashcard. Okay. Question? All right, there's some more examples, guys. I'm not gonna sit here and plow through every single one of them, but do make sure that, um, you know, you are uh, making those flashcards and that you're comfortable with that stuff. Because again, um, definitely some multiple choice questions, uh, potentially some task-based simulation and sometimes, you know, the word from the, you know, the CPA exam front is that, you know, non-monetary transactions was hard on the exam, okay? But if you make those flashcards, you should be killing on those, okay? All right, good. Involuntary conversion basically means that somebody comes and takes your property. Who? Probably the government. Government comes to you and says, hey, we're going to remove your building and we're gonna give you cash because we're putting in a new highway through here or something like that, right? And, okay. And so government has, you know, certain um, resources that um, we have to respect like the military and the police. So what are you gonna do, right? They come, they take your stuff. There's nothing you can do about it, but they are gonna give you some cash. Now, if they give you the cash, and usually it's the case that the cash that they give you is more than the book value of whatever it is that you're having to surrender, that would be an involuntary conversion. And you would record that as though, you know, you wanted to do this by just booking the gain for the difference between the cash that you got. And I guess it's right here, just booking the gain as the difference between the cash that you got and what you gave up. If they give you less than the book value, which is highly unlikely, that would be a loss. Okay. All right. Let's look at a couple questions then.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Okay, make your best shot. And um, okay, most of us got it right, 71%. Okay, and uh, sometimes I cry at night because I say to myself, well, gee, I went through all that and then there was still 30% of the people that didn't get it right. And I cry, okay, because what's going on? We said, they said they say here, uh, Balt reported what amount should Balt report in December 31st year one balance as investment in ACE, assuming the transaction has commercial substance. And we're sitting here and saying, well, if the transaction has commercial substance, I know I'm going to take the gain here. And I know that I should bring the new asset on the books, which is the ACE at what? At the book value of the assets surrendered. So they tell me that they exchanged what? They exchanged a truck for 25 shares of ACE common stock. The date of the trucks carrying amount was 2,500, okay? So I know the book value of the truck is what? Carrying amount and book value are synonymous terms is 2,500 and its fair value was 3,000. Well, if the books uh, book value of the truck was 25 and its fair value was 3,000 and this transaction has commercial substance, I'm going to take the entire gain, right? So the gain is 500 and our flashcard and thing I harped on over and over again when we were going through was the value of the new asset is the what book value of the assets surrendered, which was what three thousand dollars here? All this the rest of this is nonsense. I don't care. Don't tell me anything else about the A stock and what the book value, which doesn't matter, of the A stock was, and da -da -da. all the rest of that is a waste of time. Question. Remember guys, a minute and a half per question. They would love for you to get all tangled up in a bunch of useless facts. We're not gonna fall into that trap. Okay, good. Let's take a look at the next one. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at um, this one. This one, I guess, is a little confusing. Um, so go ahead and take your best shot. And um, I can see why there might be some confusion on this one. Um, because they say under, um, I'm going to clear this out of the way by stopping the share of the results. Most of us got it right. Uh, the answer is C, but let's get this out of the way here. Okay. And so let's just take a look at this one. The transaction is reported as a, reported as a non-monetary exchange of asset. And which of the following circumstances should the exchange be measured based on the reported amount of the non-monetary um, be measured based on the reported amount of the non-monetary asset surrendered? And um, 
the answer is C, when the transaction lacks commercial substance. If the transaction has commercial substance, is kind of confusing because if the transaction has commercial substance and the fair value and the book value are the same, then C or D could be the correct answer. Um, C is going to be the correct answer because all the time, because if we don't recognize the gain on that, then it would be um, the uh, reported based on the non-monetary assets surrendered, meaning there's no cash involved in that, right? Okay. It's not the best question. I don't know what to tell you. I don't like that question. It's confusing. Question? Thoughts? Okay, I don't care for that question, so... You know, every now and then, why they include it as one of the class questions, I don't know. I understand that every now and then you get a dumb question on the exam that you're like, what was that? And this might be one of those, right? What'd you say, James? Did I hear you? I just said I'm with you. you. I was fine until that question. Yeah. I used to send Becker um, emails about stuff like that and phone calls and whatnot. And, uh, I stopped doing that because when you teach for a living, there's this weird silence that um, is sort of like a third, like a, you know, a sixth sense that I'm not being listened to. Okay. And after a while, I would just tell them, I'm not, they're not listening to me. So I'm not going to bother to talk to them about this anymore. Okay. All right, enough of that. All right, let's go ahead then and let's turn our attention to intangible assets. Okay, now what are intangible assets? Well, intangible assets are those things that you can't really hold in your hand and feel the value of it, right? So something that's tangible, hey, this is inventory, this is tangible, I have this value, right? Intangible assets are things that, you know, hey, maybe I can't really feel the value by holding a piece of paper that gives me the right to produce this unique product, whatever, right? A patent, for example, okay? So if it's intangible, it can be specifically identifiable and tangible, something like a patent. It could be something like a... Um, a copyright, okay? I'm the only one that can use this example, which they can throw that one away as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, the book that we're looking at has a copyright on it, okay? And that copyright is an intangible value, okay? Um, goodwill is an intangible. What happens? You go to a restaurant, and somebody takes you to the restaurant and it's a dump, right? And you think, I thought this person liked me. This place is horrible. Why am I here? And then you eat the food and you're like, huh, I'm going to come back to this place. So you look at the assets that they have, the tangible assets, you think there's no value. Meanwhile, this goodwill has value, okay? So all of these things, goodwill, patents, copyright, artistic value, all are considered intangibles, okay? So the question comes up, well, what should we record an intangible then on our balance sheet? Since it has future economic benefit, it has value, we should put it on the balance sheet. And the answer is it's all about the manner of acquisition, okay? So in order to carry things like copyrights, patents, trademarks, goodwill on your um, books, you're going to have to acquire them from a third party. So if I spend all kinds of money trying to develop goodwill, I do not record that on my financial statement. I will only record it if I do what? If I've acquired that goodwill from somebody else and you acquire goodwill from somebody else in a business acquisition in which you're going to be doing consolidation. So that's not the best example of recording goodwill you buy from uh, intangible that you buy from somebody else. Let's say 
you go through all the trouble to develop the patent to be the one that will produce this thing. And so you go and you do all that work and then the uh, patent office in the United States patent office gives you a piece of paper that says you're the only one that has the right to produce this. All the money that you spent to develop that patent and get that copy, they get that patent from the US patent office is expensed. Then I come along and I buy the patent from you. Maybe you're the idea person, you get the patent, but you're not a good, you, know, you wanna go now and just live life and you know whatnot. So you sell the patent, the right to produce this to somebody like me, let's say, who's a good manufacturer and manager of that kind of stuff. When I buy that patent from you, now I can record it as an intangible asset. Okay, so the only time you record the value of intangible asset, I shouldn't say the only time because we're going to talk about exceptions in a minute, but the primary time when you are able to record a the uh, a patent on your books is if you uh, an intangible asset on the books is if you acquire it from somebody else. Okay, any cost that you spend, not any, because there are some exceptions. Um, amounts that you spend okay to develop an intangible asset should be expensed however and they tell us us gap tells you and we'll look at research and development later but you cannot you under us gap you cannot capitalize research and development okay now there are some exceptions okay so let's just go ahead and flashcard so flashcard that general rule that amounts that you spend to develop intangibles should be expensed. And then let's start to take a look down here at the exceptions, okay? Which actually, <laughs> the exceptions are what? Right here, okay? So let's just look at the exceptions. And what you can do is you can put the rule on one side of the flashcard, okay, under US GAAP, intangible assets not acquired from others, developed internally should be expensed, right? And then on the blank side of the flashcard, you can say, what are the exceptions to the rule? And the exception is legal fees related to successful defense of the asset. So what happens? Let's say you're developing this patent or whatever, and I sit there and I say, hey, I challenge your right to that patent. Or let's say you bought the patent from somebody else and you have to go to court and you have to defend your right and you win, you're successful, then you can add that to the amount that you had capitalized for that patent, okay? Now, what happens if you lose? The legal fees are expensed and the patent that you just acquired from somebody else is what? written off and then maybe you're going to go and go to court against them to get that money back or something for whatever you paid for it but if you lose you have to do what you have to write off any value you're showing for that patent and you expense the legal fees if you're successful you capitalize the legal fees um, for the defense of that passive patent registration or consulting fees you have to register the intangible somehow you can capitalize that design cost of a trademark okay so now you're gonna you know use some you know beautiful you know rendition to represent your product yeah you can capitalize that um and let's just stop there because that last one is kind of a little esoteric that's not worth your writing on a flashcard bribes to the mob huh maybe bribes to the mob <laughs> um yeah no <laughs> illegal fines are not uh, Ill bribes are not capitalizable Darn. and your successful defense of such a crime would also not be capitalizable <laughs> um yeah stay away from bad people okay all right so let's go ahead and we know that uh, eventually, I don't want to strike that out. I want to highlight that. Eventually, you will need to amortize those intangibles that you uh, capitalize, except goodwill. Goodwill is not amortized. And we're going to get into goodwill in uh, chapter uh, four, and we'll see how to handle goodwill. But the other intangibles 
um, the other intangibles uh, should be amortized, okay? So you come over and the question is, well, what method should you use? And the answer is straight line. So we don't start getting to some of those declining balance methods and stuff we were talking about last time. We just use straight line, flash card that, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's just take a look. And I'm not gonna go through the IFRS discussion of having a revaluation uh, surplus for your um, intangibles because it's the same discussion that we had for fixed assets. Remember, you can write them up and you can take that to other comprehensive income unless there's been losses in previous periods. Remember all that, okay? So I'm not gonna repeat that because there's no difference here. They repeat the same discussion if it's an intangible versus a fixed asset, okay? So let's just come over and let's take a look at what happens with franchise accounting, okay? So what happens? Let's say you're sitting there and you decided to go to the shopping mall. I don't know, food, does the food court in the shopping mall open? Probably not, right? But back in the old days when you used to eat food at the shopping mall and have a good time, remember when you enjoyed life, okay? And what would happen? You'd go to this Auntie Anne pretzel place, okay? And they sit there and they have the folding of the pretzel and you watch them do this. It's amazing how they do that. They just throw the dough and it turns into a pretzel and you sit there and you pay $4 for that. One day you say, you know, I'm just going to open up one of these places. I mean, why am I studying so hard to be an accountant and everything when all I got to do is flick of the wrist and I make $4 out of dough, right? So what happens? You say, I wonder how I do this. So you call the Auntie Anne office and they tell you, well, here's what we'll do for you. You pay us an initial franchise fee, say 50,000. You pay us that and we will give you the right for five years to hang up the Auntie Anne sign and we'll even tell you where to hang it, okay? Where you can hang it, this shopping mall, that shopping mall. They give you some of that. That initial franchise fee has future economic benefit because for the next five years, people are gonna come and pay you $4.35 for some dough that you threw into the shape of a pretzel, right? And so what'll happen? The standards say, since that's the case, you will take, and it's important guys, present value. You will take the present value okay, of that intangible asset and you will report it on the balance sheet. And then like all intangibles except goodwill, you will go ahead and amortize it over the shorter of the franchise life five years or the expected period of benefit. In other words, let's say you figure, well, after three years, people are going to stop buying pretzels. Well, then you'd amortize it over three years, whatever. Okay. Now let's say you get in there and you're trying to throw the pretzels and you can't do it. And so you call them back and you say, Hey, I need some training here. I don't know how to fold these pretzels. They say, okay, fine. We'll come back and we'll train you, but we want 5% of revenue. Well, now you're going to want to what match those training costs with that revenue. So you're going to go ahead and recognize an expense for a continuing franchise fee, okay? Usually calculated based on percentage of revenue and includes things like training programs, et cetera, okay? So the initial franchise fee is capitalized at present value and amortized. Continuing franchise fees are what? Are expensed, okay, as incurred. Now, you come over and you take a look at this example, okay? And they tell us that uh, this uh, Peter signs on July 1st, year one. Whenever you have an asset question, guys, make sure you know when that asset was put into place in case they ask you to amortize it, right? With Disco Records to operate a franchise in New York City, the initial franchise fee was $75,000 and was paid by a $25,000 down payment and the balance in five annual payments of 10,000 beginning July 1st, year two. The expected life of the franchise is 10 years. The present value is 37,908. Now, just for our purposes, if you look up um, five, 
payments, okay, five years, whatever, and it turns out that this is at 10%, the present value of the annuity factor that you see is 3.7908, okay? They used to call out that present value factor in this example, but they stopped doing that, okay? And since it's going to be what? It's five payments of how much? Five payments of, where'd my 10,000 go? Do they say that here? Yeah, five payments of 10,000. I take that 10,000, I multiply it times what? 3.7908. And when I do, I get this 37,908, don't I? Okay. So when I record the uh, value of this, well, I need to keep reading. And they say the amount to capitalize an intangible franchise asset. Um, where do they say they have no future, no further involvement? The initial franchise fee was 75,000 paid by $725,000 payment. Annual payment of 10,000, we expect a life of 10 years, the present value of five annual requirements, the amount to be capitalized in tangible, blah, blah, blah. Prepare the journal entry to record the franchise on Peter's book at the acquisition day. Explain the accounting treatment required over the life of the franchise asset. Well, could you have told me that this was just an initial franchise fee? I mean, that would have been helpful for me to know the rule here. So the assumption is, is that this is an initial franchise fee and they don't have any further responsibilities. Oh, I, I see why they don't care here. Um, they should have called it out as an initial franchise fee and not continuing franchise fee because if it's continuing, it needs to be expensed. For revenue recognition, it would matter whether or not you had continuing obligations or not. That's where I was getting confused. Okay, but uh, here it's an initial franchise fee. It's obviously not amounts that are being provided for training or anything, okay? So what happens? We have to record the note at the, uh, the, the franchise at present value. So you've got this 37,908, that's the what, present value of the future payments plus, I don't know why I'm writing again, plus 25,000, that's where they get what? The 62,908 is the present value of 25,000 that you're paying up front is 25,000. The note payable, they're gonna record at the 50,000. That's the gross amount of the note. Now, sometimes students say, well, where did the discount come from? Well, if the present value of a note receivable is 50,000, then, uh, excuse me, a note payable is 50,000 then the way I'm going to show the note on my financial statements, right, is going to be note payable net. And I have to show that at present value, 37,908. And since the present value net is 37,908, they tell me I have to show the discount. And I show the discount is 12,092, right? Just showing you where they got the discount from, okay? Because you tend to think, well, the discount must have came first because it was in the journal entry first, but actually the gross amount of the note and the present value came first and that allowed us to calculate the discount. And of course you credit the cash for the 25,000 cash coming out. Okay, question. Now they go ahead and- I do have a question. Yeah. Um, how did they get that uh, factor amount? I was looking at the present value tables and I did not find when I is equal to 10% and uh, N is equal to five years, uh, this number of 3.7908, which, which table did they use to get that? Um, did you look amount? at present value of an annuity or present value of a dollar? Um, I looked at uh, present value of um, an, annuity, an, an annuity due as well as of a dollar. Uh, don't look at annuity due, it's ordinary annuity. It's ordinary annuity. It's not annuity due. Or, or, or annuity due assumes payments are coming at the beginning of the year. Ordinary annuity assumes that the payments are coming at the end of the period. And this was an ordinary annuity. Okay. Um, 
even then I'm not able to find because I looked at three different uh, tables and none of them seem to have that kind of corresponding value. I'm also looking at uh, present value, interest factors, $1 discounted at K percent for end periods. That is not the one. All right, wait um, a minute. just a second. I'm, I'm highly doubting what you're saying, but let's see. Um, so where do I want to go here? block me from the search engine. Present value of annuity, five periods, 10%. Are you telling me that you did not see this number on your present value table? Because if you didn't, throw it away, please. Right, Professor. Professor, can you, can you if you don't mind, upload these tables in the, in, in the, in the discussion area? I really find it very tough to find these annuity tables. Uh, it's always some sort of incorrect table that I'm looking at. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about that. I'll put them up there, but you know, um, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the angel of John Lord is going to come down during your exam and say, here you go, this is the right table. Okay, so I'll put them up there, but let's make sure we're clear, okay? Present value, of, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do it right now. Present value of a dollar means what? One payment? Means it's just one payment? So present value of a dollar, you'd have to use that table because it's one payment. And present value is always less than the current amount, isn't it? So if you look at this table, all the numbers on this table are smaller than one. And all the numbers are smaller than one because I know the present value has to be less than the amount that's gonna be paid out sometime in the future, right? Right. It's just one payment. When you look at the annuity tables, okay, all the numbers are greater than one because it's more than one payment. So it has to be more than one to get the present value, doesn't it? Okay, the only row that has a number that is less than one is the one payment row. And I argue that if I was president, I would say that all present value of annuity tables should have the one payment row blocked out because if it's only one payment, it's not an annuity. And we have a table for one payment. That's the present value of the dollar table. And if you compare those two tables, the one payment row is identical. Okay. Right. So Thank you so much. And, and if the payments, and then the only other thing you need to remember is if the payment is at the end of the period, it's an ordinary annuity. If the payment is at the beginning of the period, it's an annuity due. And we're going to talk about that more in chapter five. Okay. All right. But I'll, yeah, I'll put these up, but you do need to get that kind of straight. And, you know, it's easy for me to make it sound easy. You know, 30 years of looking at this stuff. So it is easy for me. It only took me about 28 years until I finally got it. Okay. So keep practicing with that, but you'll be fine. All right. Okay. So where were we? We were looking at the textbook, right? Okay. All right. So that's where I got that factor from. And I knew, and I knew it was, you say, well, how do you know it was 10%? Because in the olden days, this book used to call out um, the factor, you know, they told you it was 10% at five periods and they gave you the factor. Okay. Well, I knew, you know, it was five periods because they did tell us it was five payments. Okay. Now I'm going to do something else here and I'm going to co-op some of this space because I think it's unfair that we give you this example. And then in the book, they start asking you to amortize this note payable. Okay. Now, when I'm going to show you how to amortize it, um, well, first, let me show you how to do the interest expense, okay? Because we do have interest expense on this thing, 37908 times what? And again, I know it's 10% interest because the uh, old example told us. 
and then it's times be careful times one half because they didn't sign this note until July 1st. So this becomes 1,895. And then you're going to debit interest expense, 1,895. And credit the discount. 1895 okay and they also show us the amortization of the uh, patent and the amortization of the patent is going to be a debit to amortization expense of 3145 right 62,000 it was said as a, it had a 10 year life but they didn't put into service till July 1st. So that's only half the year. And usually for um, intangibles, we don't use an accumulated amortization account. We usually take that amortization directly to the intangible asset. So I would go ahead and credit franchise 3145. Okay, so that's the journal entry that comes off of that. And I'm just showing you, you'd also have to calculate interest expense. Now, pretend that they bought this asset July 1st, guys, because I don't want to have to get into half years amortization of discount, okay? So when they signed the note payable, it was for 50,000, wasn't it? Isn't that what we credited? I'm just posting this, okay? And we debited discount for 12,092, didn't we? Okay, so we got the discount getting debited for 12,092. Okay, now again, I'm ignoring this half year nonsense here, okay? I'm just assuming they, they did all this on January 1st. So it's 12,092. Now what happens? They're going to have to pay 10,000 each year, right? So at the end of that first year now, I'm assuming that they're going to go ahead and debit note payable for 10. And they're going to sit here and credit cash for 10, because they got to pay 10,000 a year. So that's going to bring that note payable down to how much? 40,000, right? But I also have to amortize the discount. Okay, so what am I going to do there? Well, I'm going to take that um, 37,908, the present value, 37,908. I'm going to multiply that by what? And again, it's 10%. And that's going to give me 3,791. So again, I'm assuming a full year. I would debit interest expense, $3,791, and I'm gonna credit the discount, 3,791. Now, when I credit the discount, 3,791, now the balance in the discount account is eight, three, zero one so the carrying value for that note now as we go into near year two is going to be what note payable is just look at the ledger note payable is 40 discount is what discount is eight three zero one right discount minus the note payable gives me the net note payable, which is essentially now its new present value of, uh, da, da, da. somebody got a number for me here. Was that 31,699? Okay. And so if they ask me in a problem, because they love to do that, they'll say, well, what would be the interest for the second year? Because they want to see you sweat. So the interest for the second year would be what? That new carrying amount for the second year times 10% or 3,170. Okay, and I point that out to you because 
you get into some of the homework problems here and all of a sudden they're asking you about um, franchise, but what they're really asking you is, can you amortize a note payable? That's how you do it. Okay. And I'm not going to go through five years here. If you want to go through five years and see how it all works out at the end, that's up to you. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look at our startup cost. Okay. And here's the deal. Whenever an entity is starting something, when you're starting something, what do you do? Expense the cost. The presumption of FASB way back when they did FASB 2 is that most things that start that you're trying to start will what? Fail. And they didn't want to get into the business where they're seeing companies capitalize things like startup costs so that potential investors come up and go, oh, looky, look at all these assets. This is going to be a wonderful company. Meanwhile, you know, it's a bunch of idiots running the show and this thing's going to crash. So FASB said, no, any money you spend to start up something should be expensed. Okay, now you come over and you take a look at the next page and they sort of continue that theme. And we really already kind of hit on this a little bit when it comes to research and development cost. Research and development, you're trying to start something, aren't you? Okay. And they tell us that under US GAAP, you should expense research and development, which I want you to flashcard, unless it's one of these things, okay, these exceptions. And the exception is if you're talking about an asset that has uh, use beyond the life of the research and development project, then amortize it over its total useful life and just take the depreciation actually. Um, then you should go ahead and take the depreciation amortization on that because it has a life that goes beyond the uh, research and development, beyond the current period, I should say. And since the benefit goes beyond the future period, go ahead and depreciate that. But don't, re don't expense the entire cost of that equipment. But the depreciation is part of your research and development line item on your financial statements. So let me back up a little bit. Research and development line item on financial statements. Do you think it's important on the income statement? They, this, they're telling us to expense all this. Do you think research and development is an important line item on an entity's financial statements, on their income statement? Yes. yes. Yeah. The what? The analysts are very interested in that one versus selling expenses or versus administrative expenses because they're like, well, even though U.S. GAAP is telling us we need to expense it, there's some value potentially to that, right? So they look at that a lot differently. Okay. So again, you should expense the amounts you spend for research and development. But if you buy a piece of equipment and it has a longer term life, then you should depreciate that, but the depreciation is part of the research and development line item on the income statement, okay? That's one exception. The other exception is if you're doing the research on behalf of somebody else. So now I'm a research company and you give me some money and you say, I want you to research a pill that's gonna, you know, grow hair on an orange or something, right? And I sit there and I say, okay, well, if you're gonna pay for it, you're gonna reimburse me for any cost under a contract, then what? Then I will go ahead and capitalize the cost of that research. You, the, re the uh, purchaser will do what? You will expense it. So eventually it does get expensed by who? By the purchaser. For me, I can capitalize that. I'm in a sense doing what? creating inventory, right? And then when I sell that inventory, that'll show up as my cost of sales or whatever, I'll debit cost of sales, credit the inventory. You, when you acquire it, it's not an asset. And say, I'm assuming you're paying for this research. It's not an asset, it's, a, it's an expense to you. You will expense it, okay? All right, good. Now, it is important that you flashcard down here 
items that are not considered research and development because they'll give you a list and they're going to try to trick you into including these things as research and development. Routine periodic design changes, okay, to old products. Does that sound like something new? No. Old products, you're just changing the design. You expense it, but it's not research and development. So these are good things that should be expensed, but they're not part of the research and development line item, right? And, you know, FASB is getting up in your face a little bit about that because companies trying to land as much as they can in that research and development line item, right? Quality control testing. If you got quality control testing, you have a product. Whatever reformulation of a chemical compound is, go ahead and flashcard that because I guess, you know, maybe there were questions that mentioned that and that's why the book put it there. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. IFRS rule is very easy. You can flashcard that if you want to. If you're taking the exam before July 1st, so IFRS says that um, you should uh, expense the research, but you should, but you can capitalize the development. Okay, more generous rule in how we treat the uh, research and development, I guess. Okay. Okay, good. Now you look at this question and it's not terribly enlightening in that all of these things constitute research and development, right? Where it gets interesting is right here, okay? And you get right here now, we have the equipment and then they have the depreciation on that equipment. Again, you just take depreciation on the equipment. I mean, most equipment has longer than one year of life, unless you're destroying the equipment in the process, but assuming you're gonna be able to use that equipment beyond the current year, then you would go ahead and you're using that equipment in the research and development, you would depreciate that and that depreciation is part of the research and development line item. The total is what gets reported on the income statement. And you could footnote different aspects of that if you want, but uh, generally it's just one line item. Okay. All right, good. Not too difficult. Let's go ahead and let's go look at computer software development. And this is where US GAAP starts getting criticized and that people say, well, it's so rules-based. IFRS is principles-based. IFRS says one rule. Expense the research, capitalize the development. They, that's all they say, right? Whereas US GAAP says, well, if it's computer software development, we're gonna come up with a statement of position that's gonna tell you that you should expense cost before te technological feasibility. And we're gonna allow you to capitalize cost after technological feasibility. And they give us a bunch of things it constitutes um, technological feasibility, and I don't care because I'm not a computer software guy, okay? And they're not going to get to that level of, uh, you know, granular on the exam. So I just need to remember the phrase technological feasibility. Expense before, capitalize after, okay? Now, once I have capitalized, the software development, okay, then I can, then I have to amortize that. And I'm going to amortize it using one of these two, either the percentage revenue approach or the straight line, whichever gives me the greater amount of amortization. And that can change from year to year, okay? So for example, let's say that my revenue for the period and I'm just making these numbers up is 1 million. Let's say that the total projected revenue, okay, is 4 million. Let's say that this software has an estimated economic life of 10 years. And guys, I know 10 years is ridiculous for software. Just humor me here, okay? And so I have 1 million divided by 4 million, that's 25%. I've got what? One divided by 10, that's what? 10%, which one is greater? Not a trick question. 
So I would use a percentage of revenue to amortize that software cost that first year. So if my software costs were say, you know, 100,000, that's what I capitalized after technological feasibility, I'd multiply that by 0.25, I'd take depreciation that first year, whatever, right? Okay. Now let's say in year two now, I'll use blue for year two. Okay, let's say in year two now, let's say the uh, revenue comes to uh, 200,000 for year two. And I have what? I have this uh, 4 million of estimated total revenue on the project. That comes to what? 0 0.05, I'm doing my math right, okay. So now what happens? Well, now in year two, the 10% number is bigger. So I would go with the straight line in year two. So you go year to year, depending on which of the methods. It's not like you're locked into one of the methods once you start. It depends from year to year, which one gives you what? Which one gives you the greater amount of amortization? Okay. Okay, good. Now, um, we would carry this inventory at lower cost or market, okay? Um, where market is equal to the net realizable value. So just like we've talked about for any inventory, we're assuming you're developing this inventory for resale in this example, like any inventory, you would carry it at the uh, lower of cost or net realizable value essentially. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and if you are, you guys okay? Did you fall out somewhere? You still there? Okay. We're here. Right. Okay, we're gonna go to a break here in a little while, guys. I want. I'm struggling to finish chapter three, and uh, maybe I'm talking too much. Okay, so I want to get through chapter three here. I'm hoping before we go to the break. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at um, software development now, not for resale, but for internal use. And they tell us to expense cost during the preliminary project state, right? And then they tell us that we can capitalize cost after the preliminary project state. So all we've done here is we have replaced the word technological feasibility with preliminary project state if the software is being developed for internal purposes. Okay, so go ahead and flashcard that. Now, um, I look at this and I'm like, okay, so companies would probably want to do what? Probably want to sit there and put uh, as much cost as they can in the capitalization, right? But then by the same token, if they're sitting there and they're developing this software and they're kind of researching and development, maybe it looks better down in the research and development line item on the financial statement. So, you know, companies should basically be very careful in being precise in how they're determining the preliminary project state, right? And then, of course, whatever I capitalize, then I should amortize. And then when I'm amortizing after the um, preliminary project state, well, that's now just depreciation of an asset and that's not showing up as research and development. So. On the one hand, you're thinking, yeah, you want to capitalize as much of those costs as you can. On the other hand, you're sitting there saying, well, if I don't capitalize it and I expense it now, I get to put it down in research and development line items. So again, companies should, you know, do it precisely and not think about the, you know, what did we say? Uh, freedom from bias, okay, and uh, what we should be thinking about. Anyway. If you turn around and you later sell that software to somebody, if you sell it, you should recognize gain or loss. Recognize the gain or loss. If you sell it for more than its book value at that point, then you should go ahead and recognize the gain. If you sell it for less than its book value, recognize the loss, okay? And when you amortize that amount that you capitalize after technological feasibility, 
you should use straight line. Okay, I'll tell you what we're gonna do because I can see I'm gonna kill you before we get to the break here if I um, if I keep going and try to finish chapter three. So let's work these questions and then we'll take the break um, and then we'll come back and finish the last part of chapter three. Oh, sorry guys, you want the poll, right? Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Take your best shot, okay? And um, let's look at it. And okay, most of us got it right. Um, we're at 76%, that's pretty good. There's a couple of layers to this question. So uh, let's go through it here together. Okay, and I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing the results. The answer is B, most of us got it right. So let's just take a look, okay? And what's going on? All right, so we have this dairy company was granted a patent on January 2nd, year one, and appropriately capitalized 45,000. I don't like the way they say they were granted a patent and capitalized 45,000. I don't know why they say, don't say that they bought it from somebody, okay? But um, they got this patent, and if the exam tells you they appropriately capitalized, you don't argue with that, okay? Gary was amortizing the patent over an S they made a useful life of 15 years. So they're taking that 45,000 and dividing it by 15 years. So what's that, 3,000 per year? Okay, so it's 3,000 per year. And then they tell me that during year three, they paid, uh, year four, they paid some legal fees. So what's happening? If they're sitting there and they were taking 3,000 a year and they amortize that for three years, 
then before all this legal trouble started, they had already amortized off 9,000. So if you take that 9,000, when they start year four, right, start of year four, they were at 36,000. Okay, that's year four, the start of year four. Okay, and then they paid what? 15,000 for the legal fees. So if they paid the 15,000 for legal fees, and I shouldn't have added them in there until I looked to make sure that they were what? successfully defending the attempt, then th that means that they should add that 15,000 in. After the legal action was completed, Gary sold the patent for 75,000. So what happens? Well, if you take the 36 plus the 15 now, this patent had a book value of 51,000. And then if you sold it for 75,000, that's a gain of the 24,000, the correct answer. And uh, they say they take no amortization year of disposal. So I don't have to get myself tangled up. Well, when in the year did they sell it? Cause I might have to take more amortization for year four. No, because they, they don't take amortization in the year of sale. Question? Okay, good. I'm assuming that silence means that you have moved on to question two. <laughs> While I'm sitting here is pouring my heart out as to how to answer the first one. So I'll go ahead and I'll put the poll back up. For question two. Okay, guys, let's go ahead. I um, want to move us on. So let's take a look at the um, choices here. And yeah, most of us got it right. Okay, it's choice C. But there are a couple of important um, things to consider here. So the correct answer is C. Most of us got it right. But um, let's just look right here. On January 2nd, the current year, Rafa company purchased a franchise with a useful life of 10 years for 50,000. Additional franchise fee of 3% of franchise operation revenues must be paid each year to the franchisor. Revenues amounted to 400,000. What should we report as the intangible asset? Well, that means that if that's what they're asking me, that what all of this is distractor. This is expensed, isn't it? As it's incurred, that 3%, okay? But what I would do is I would capitalize that amount they paid up front. I divide that by how many years? 10 years, that's what? That's 5,000 per year. 
that 5,000 per year now, I would subtract off, right, for that first and make sure, you know, when they put it in use, they put it in use January 2nd. So we're good taking the full year. So by the end of year one, it's carried at 45,000, right? Now, if I said what should be recognized as expense, um, you know, and they'd have to, they'd have to be clear about whether they want the amortization expenses. They said, what's the total expense? Then I would go ahead and I would take the depreciation expense or amortization expense for an intangible, we call it amortization expense of 5,000. And I would have to do what? Take the 400,000 times 3%, what's that? Um, 12,000? if they ask me total expense on that. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at, let's do this last one together because I want to get us to the break. Okay, so they give me these different things and then they tell me what should I recognize as research and development expense. So equipment purchase for current and future projects. Well, if it's current and future projects, I'm going to capitalize that 100,000 and then I'm going to depreciate it. And so they tell me the, the equipment has what? Has a five year life. So I'll take that 100,000 divided by five. And so I don't pick up the full 100,000. I just pick up what? the depreciation part of that or the 20,000, right? Then what? Then they tell me equipment purchase, but it's purchased for what? Current year only. Well, if it's a current year only, then it has no future economic benefit. So I'm going to have to do what? Take that whole 200,000, okay? Research and development salaries, that's easy. The uh, fees, to obtain uh, legal fees to obtain a patent, okay? Uh, legal fees to obtain the patent, I'm gonna have to pick that up. And then materials and labor costs, I'm gonna pick that up. And when I add all that up, I should get, uh, what'd I do? Why does that look like it's not gonna work? Does that up to one million two hundred twenty thousand? Legal fees to obtain patent should be capitalized. What should be capitalized? Legal fees to obtain patent. Oh, so it's 50,000 off? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. I apologize because when I made my notes, I checked off the legal fees for some reason and I shouldn't have. So the legal fees don't belong in there, right? Yeah, because you capitalize that because it was part of one of those exceptions, right? Okay, good. So when you add all these up, you get the 1 million to two oh 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 oh. Is that right? Okay. All right, good. Let's take a break, guys, because we're going to explode here. So um, let's take 10 minutes and come back at seven. We're still going to be in chapter three because I want to quickly talk about impairment. It won't take us that long, but I don't want to wait any longer for the break. And then we'll start chapter four. Okay. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, knock out this uh, module eight on impairment so we can at least uh, make some progress into chapter four tonight, okay, with the time we have left. So let's just take a look at the discussion of impairment. And 
Um, they talk about the idea of intangible assets, and we'll talk about goodwill, as I said, uh, in the next chapter. But really, the impairment process that we're talking here for intangibles is no different than what would you what you would do for impairment of a fixed asset. Uh, so it's not really necessary for them to call it a separate uh, impairment for intangibles. Um, all assets um, other than goodwill uh, would be uh, calculated or evaluated for impairment this way. Okay, so basically what we do when we're looking at the impairment for a fixed asset for an intangible other than goodwill, we will do two steps. The first step will be to look at basically the undiscounted cash flows expected to result from the use of that asset. And we will then compare those to the carrying value of that asset. And if the undiscounted cash flows are more than the carrying value, no impairment, we don't do anything else. If the undiscounted cash flows are less than that carrying value, then we have determined that what? There's impairment, and then we will go to step two. And in step two, we will now compare the carrying value to the um, fair value of that asset to calculate the amount of impairment. And when we look at the fair value, fair value often will equal discounted cash flows. So it gets a little confusing sometimes when you're looking at this stuff because you're saying, well, wait a minute, when do I discount the cash flows? When do I not discount them? And the answer is, well, you do both. To figure out if you have impairment, you look at undiscounted cash flows to calculate the amount of impairment uh, then you would have to discount those cash flows. Okay, so go ahead and flashcard those steps. And then you can also flashcard for once they give us a pass key that is useful and that to determine the amount, uh, determine whether or not you have cash flow, use uh, to determine if you have impairment, use undiscounted cash flows to calculate the amount of impairment they say use fair value and you can flashcard that but i'm going to put in parentheses what discount cf cash flows okay okay good now that's all i want to see from the outline i want to come over to the um, schematic over here which is useful okay so what happens? So we sit here and we look at the undiscounted cash flows. We subtract the net carrying amount. And if the net carrying amount is more than the undiscounted cash flows, it means we'll get a positive number, no impairment, we stop. Okay. If we look at the undiscounted cash flows and we compare that to the carrying amount and we get a negative number, that means the carrying value is more than the cash flows. They are said to me that we're not going to recover our cash flows. We have impairment. And I want you to flashcard what we do if we have impairment. Okay. And flashcard that if we have impairment and the asset is held for disposal, what should you do? Well, you will go ahead and compare that fair value now to the uh, net carrying value. And here, now the fair value could very well be what? discounted cash flows, okay? You compare that fair value to the net carrying amount, that'll be your impairment loss. And of course, if you're gonna dispose of the asset, then there will be disposal costs associated with that. You gotta pay somebody to haul this old piece of equipment away, whatever it is, that'll be part of the total impairment loss. You write the asset down, you do not depreciate it, amortize it any further, Restoration is permitted, but what? Restoration means you can only write it up to that original book value. You can't write it up above the original book value, okay? Now, if the asset is uh, held for use, then the main difference here in the calculation of the impairment loss is, of course, there's no disposal cost. You write the asset down you will now depreciate that new cost and restoration is not permitted at all 
I already asked you to flashcard that box. Okay. Okay, good. So let's look at a numerical example. We've got our key flashcards, but let's practice with this a little bit now. And so they tell me that the assets carrying amount is 900,000. They tell me that the what? Net future cash flows right down. They should have been more careful to call that what? Undiscounted. Those are the undiscounted cash flows are a million. And so what happens? The undiscounted cash flows are more than the carrying value. Therefore, there is no impairment and we stop. We don't do another thing. Okay, now on the next page, they come over and they say, well, what if the assets net carrying value is 1.2? And again, the undiscounted, they probably should have made that very clear. The undiscounted cash flows are 1 million. Okay, now in assumption one, the asset is held for use. And, the, and now these would be discounted cash flows, right? They say present value. PV is present value. The discounted, so this is undiscounted CF is cash flows. The discounted cash flows are 700,000. Now, if the asset is held for use, you'll take that 700,000, the undiscounted cash flows, and you will basically compare that to the carrying value. You have a $500,000 loss. If you're sitting there and the asset is held for disposal, now you take that 700,000, you compare that to the carrying value of 12, you got 500, but now you've got to bring in the disposal cost to calculate that total loss. And you saw how we treat those losses uh, under the two scenarios, asset held for use, asset is uh, going to be disposed of. Question, did you guys come back from break? Yes, yeah. we're here. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Good, guys. So we've seen that now. So why don't we just go ahead and take a look at a couple questions because I'm dying to get us into chapter three here. I mean, at four. We're spending a lot of time on chapter three. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple and I will give you the poll for this. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, end the poll a little bit early because uh, I want to move on, number one. But number two, um, you know, if you're taking a little longer, I think that means that you're probably on the wrong path. But most of us got it right, okay, 83% of us, which is what? Um, if you look at this question, they tell me that the undiscounted cash flows are 515 and the carrying value of the asset is five, I have no impairment. If the undiscounted cash flows are more than the carrying value of the asset, stop, no impairment. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look then at the next one, question two here.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop you again a little quicker than we normally do. And the reason being, again, this is one of those that if you're getting too tangled up, uh, you're probably on the wrong track, so you might as well take a look. Most of us got it right. Its answer is A, and the issue here is this asset had to be written down, and then they determined in the next year as they continued to use that asset, they tell us that it's used in operations, they discovered that there was some recovery there, but we said that if you're holding the asset for use, restoration is not permitted. So you should take what? You should take nothing for restoration if you're holding the asset for use. Okay, question? Okay, good. So that means I can finally close chapter three and jump into chapter four. Okay, now chapter four really is broken into two major uh, segments here. Okay, one is going to be looking at uh, investments. Okay, and we're going to really focus on two methods for investments. One is going to be the fair value through um, income, fair market value through income method. Um, and that tends to be, you know, a few points and then the equity method. And so you add these two together, the equity method and the fair value through net income method, that tends to be about five points. Okay. Now where we're going to really chew up some point value. Okay is going to be when we start talking about consolidations. That is 10 points, okay? Every exam, for when I took the exam, when everyone takes the exam, you can expect either a task-based simulation on consolidation, or you can expect a raft of multiple choice questions or a combination thereof, okay? So what I'm going to pray to do is finish these first two modules tonight. If not, we'll just roll with it and pick it up on uh, Tuesday. But I don't want to say much more because I want to get us into the material. Okay. But obviously, chapter four is important, right? Okay. All right. Good. So they're all important. One time somebody, I brought somebody in, not here at Golden Gate to teach a class and she told me, you gave me all the hard classes. I'm like, they're all hard. <laughs> what are you talking about, okay? So all of the chapters are important. They all got a good wealth of material and um, we're going to work through this, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at our financial assets that we're talking about here. And we are really talking about stocks and bonds, okay? That's really, the focus here, stocks and bonds. We're not going to get into a bunch of boutique financial instruments. It's stocks, it's bonds that we're talking about here. Okay. Now, when we deal with these stocks and bonds, they give us something called the fair value option. Okay. And what they're saying to us is, look, there are some securities, primarily the debt securities, really, that you can carry as um, trading securities or available for sale securities, or you could carry them in amortized cost. If you carry them in amortized cost, then you don't recognize uh, differences in fair value in your income in any period, and you just carry them at their amortized cost. And we'll talk more about that. If we're dealing with an available for sale security for our debt securities, debt securities being bonds, then you would be taking certain amount of difference between fair value and the original cost and including that as part of your comprehensive income. Okay. Um, what uh, what um, fair value option tells us is for those securities, you could treat them equivalent to what we call a trading security. And basically what you'll do is your month, a uh, year to year, look at the difference between the fair value and the cost and just take that difference into the income statement okay so let's just take a look okay entities 
okay, on a specific election date. Entities may choose to measure fair value eligible instruments that are not typically measured at fair value. Again, those that are being carried at amortized cost. And they tell us that under the fair value option, unrealized gains and losses are reported in earnings. In other words, they go straight to the income statement. We don't do anything with comprehensive income. We don't have them being carried at amortized costs. Once that election is made, you cannot reverse it. Okay, so let's just take a look at the nature of eligible uh, financial instruments for this. And they tell us an example. For example, an entity can choose to measure at fair value a debt instrument that would otherwise be classified as available for sale with unrealized gains and losses recorded in earnings rather than OCI, okay? Or an entity can choose to measure at fair value an equity investment that would otherwise be accounted for using the equity method. Why don't you just flashcard those examples in case you get a specific example that asks you, could you do this under the fair value method? So again, under fair value method, you don't have to worry about if you choose that, the fair value option, you don't have to run things through the um, other comprehensive income, or if you're required to use the equity method, um, you could choose to use the uh, fair value method, all right? Now you come over and they do give us certain things that aren't going to be allowed for the fair value method. For example, if you have a subsidiary that you have to consolidate, then they're saying to you, uh -uh, we're not gonna let you skip the consolidation and simply uh, use the fair value method. If you go to consolidation, fair value uh, option, I keep telling you method, fair value option is not available to you, okay? All right, so that's something that's out there. And what it's gonna allow you to do is take some of these primarily debt instruments, okay? That you may be putting in these different classifications and we're gonna see what the rules are and treat them all as though they were trading securities, okay? So we're talking about debt here. And we have three categories, trading securities available for sale or um, amortized costs, okay? Let's talk about trading securities, okay? And these trading securities are those that are held for the principal, for the principal purpose of selling them in the near term, okay? Because there's frequent buying and selling, okay? Now, if you are treating something as a trading security, is classified as a trading security are generally reported as current assets, um, and not non-current. Sometimes there's a time where you might count them current, but for the most part, they're treated as uh, current assets, okay? Now I'm gonna go over to held to maturity, and then I'll come back to available for sale. Held for maturity securities, and these are investments in debt securities classified as held in maturity if the corporation has the positive intent and ability to hold those securities to maturity. Now you look at that and you say, well, if I was auditing something, how would I determine their intent? And we would literally ask management to put in writing that they intend to hold those to maturity, okay? If the intent is to hold the security for an indefinite period of time, but not necessarily maturity, then we're gonna take that over to available for sale. Okay, and securities classified as held to maturity are uh, based on current or non-current depending on how close they are to maturity. So if they're gonna mature the next year, they'd be current. If it's gonna be more than a year, they would be considered uh, non-current, okay? Now let's go back to available for sale. And the reason I did this is really, if you read what FASB says here, they say, look, you have trading securities, if you're going to be trading them frequently, if you're gonna hold them to maturity, held to maturity, and anything that doesn't fit in those other two categories defaults to available for sale, okay? So they basically say that here, available for sale securities are those not meeting the definition of the other two classifications, and they will be what? They will be current or non-current depending on the intent of the corporation, of course, 
if the corporation hadn't said, well, gee, you know, we were holding the held to maturity, but we don't really know. So they called it available for sale. And then they, you know, had a long term on it. So they were calling it non-current. And then they finally got up to the point where it's going to mature the next year. Then it's not based on their intent. It's based on the fact that it is now, you know, going to mature that next year and should be carried as current. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's go ahead and take a look now at um, how we will basically set up the valuation. Okay. Oh, I want to say one more thing first. Again, under the fair value option, an entity could do what? Look at its available for sale securities and its held in maturity securities. And it turns out under the fair value option, the accounting is what? Treating them as though they are trading securities. So even though you may have a security with the positive intent and ability to hold it in maturity, it's a held in maturity security. Under the fair value option, they let you do what? Treat it as though it was a trading security. But once you make that election, you're stuck with it for however long you hold that thing. Okay. Okay, good. So let's take a look at debt securities reported at fair value. Okay. And so what's happening? If we're doing that and we're carrying them at fair value, we're probably talking about trading securities. Again, we do have that fair value option. Okay. And what? Any gains and losses are going to be included in net income. So what happens, you sit there and you debit unrealized loss on trading security, of course, assuming that what that fair value has fallen below whatever the carrying value is. And then you credit and you credit a valuation account, which is a contra against that investment, which is going to bring its carrying value down to the fair value. Sometimes it's easier for me just to think, okay, I'm going to credit the investment. Okay. And that's going to bring that investment down because I've had an unrealized loss. Okay. The unrealized loss is reported on the income statement. And I write that security down on the balance sheet. Right. Okay. If it's a gain, then what? Then I'm going to sit here and uh, I would debit the valuation account or debit the security and credit unrealized gain. Okay. Now, if we're talking about available for sale security, now what happens? Well, notice, guys, the balance sheet treatment is exactly the same. I'm going to write it down to that fair value, whatever it is on the balance sheet, right? So I'm going to credit the investment here, whatever, right? Because I have a loss, okay? If I'm sitting here and I have the loss like this and it's an available for sale security, notice I still debit this account called unrealized loss on now available for sales securities but that amount is reported on the statement of other comprehensive income remember we talked talk back in chapter one we have our net income and unrealized losses on the trading securities would be part of my calculation of net income it'd probably be a non-operating item but it would be part of my calculation of my net income right if and then for um, other comprehensive income and we had what unrealized gains and losses was one of those right for those things then i would continue on on my comprehensive income statement and start calling out things like this unrealized loss on available for sale security and that would allow me to then calculate my comprehensive income remember comprehensive income is net income plus other comprehensive income and unrealized holding gains and losses on available for sales securities constitutes part of my other comprehensive income. Okay, so I'll continue on that lower part to report this. And of course, if it's a gain, then I would go ahead and do what? I'd do the mirror image here in which I would be debiting the uh, security or the valuation account and I would have a credit to um, unrealized gain in that case. And that unrealized gain would be um, increasing my comprehensive income. It would be uh, a gain reported on the, as an other comprehensive income item. Okay. 
Okay, good. Now, stop me if there's a question, guys. Okay, realized gains and losses means I sold the security. When I sell the security, that is considered realized. Realized gains and losses are reported straight onto the income statement. Once you sell the thing, that's reported on the income statement. Okay. Okay, good. Now, the assets that are carried on the balance sheet at amortized cost are my held to maturity securities. And we're going to get into amortized costs more in F5. But an, um, amortized cost is simply the face of this debt security that you're holding as an investment plus a premium or minus a discount. It can't be both, right? Well, if you had several securities, you could have some of that a premium and some of that a discount. But any one security, the, um, the amortized cost is going to be face minus the discount or can't be both on one security or face plus the premium, okay? There is no amount that needs to be taken to the income statement for differences between fair value and the carrying amount on realized gains and losses because you don't calculate them. You just simply carry that at amortized cost, okay? Okay, good. Now you looked and you said, well, John, that was a lot of detail and you didn't call out a flashcard. Uh, much flashcarding there. And the reason being that what? It's right here. Okay, so notice three classifications. And this is for debt. Okay, this is for our debt securities. Three classifications trading, available for sale, held to maturity. Okay, let's look at trading. Could be current or non current, depending on the in intent of the company, but most commonly it's going to be current. On the balance sheet, it's reported at what? BS at fair value. Unrealized holding gains and losses go where? Go to the income statement, IS, okay? And for purposes of cash flow, if it is one that is considered current, then we're going to sit there and uh, put that information for the cash flow on that in the operating section of the statement of cash flow. If it is something that is considered non-current, then we would put that information in the investing category. Okay. Available, uh, let's do held to maturity. Held to maturity could be current or non-current, depending on when it's going to mature, right? We carry it at amortized costs. Amortized costs is the face plus the premium, face minus the discount. There are no unrealized holding gains and losses. This is the balance sheet. Okay, there are no unrealized holding gains and losses. And the activity for that is reported in the investing section on our statement of cash flows. Okay, available for sale could be current or non current, depending on the intent of the company or it's time to maturity, of course, fair value on the balance sheet, just like for trading, but now what? Now unrealized holding gains and losses go to the income statement, okay? And note here what they said for this little star here, if trading securities are classified as non-current, the balance sheet and the trading security transaction would be reported as invested. If trading debt securities are classified as current on the balance sheet, trading securities transaction report on the operating uh, for operating section on the statement of cash flow. So you can flashcard that part just to make sure you're clear why we're saying operating or investing. Question. Again, if a company wants to, it could take its held and maturity securities. It's available for sale securities and under the fair value option, treat them as though they were trading securities. Question. Okay, let me ask you a question. Trading security, unrealized holding gains and losses. Don't look at the book, look at me. Where do we report unrealized holding gains and losses? Income statement. Good. Uh, held a maturity security, where do we where do we report unrealized holding gains and losses? Nowhere. 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 Unless they're determined to be permanent. If you think the drop in value is permanent, then it does go to the income statement, but that's the exception. 
okay, you probably won't even get a question on that. You'll just be annoyed by the fact that the question keeps saying, and they determine this loss is not going to be permanent, then you don't report it uh, anywhere, right? Okay, good. And if it's available for sale, it's what? OCI, okay. Which category do you, re uh, which categories do you report at fair value? On the Trading and available for sale. Okay, good. We're good. All right, excellent. Okay, we can stop with all that. Now, let's take a look at reclassification. Okay, and uh, let's do what here? Let's flashcard it down here. Right here. Okay, so I have a security. I'm carrying it as trading. And I'm going to move it from trading to any other category. They tell you, well, look, unrealized holding gains and losses have already, re already been recognized in net income. And they say no adjustment necessary. You will not adjust it out. Okay, it stays on the income statement. So year one, the security was worth 100,000. I was treating it as a trading and the fair value was 90,000 at the end of that first year. So I took what a loss to the income statement of 10,000. If I decide later, oh, I'm gonna put it in available for sale. You don't make any adjustment for that. You just go forward with that new classification, okay? If you are in any other category and you go to training, uh, trading, then what? Then you will go ahead and immediately record any unrealized holding gains and losses into income. So anything that was sitting in OCI, you would take out of OCI and put it into regular income. Or if you hadn't been recognizing losses because you were treating it as a held to maturity before, you will immediately do what? Take those differences between fair value and, um, and amortized costs straight to the income statement, okay? If it was held to maturity and it went to available for sale, now any losses that you weren't recognizing, like you all said, anywhere before, now you will immediately take those unrealized holding gains and losses and take immediately to what? Take them immediately to comprehensive income, okay? Now, this is the one that gets interesting. What if you were available for sale and you went to held to maturity. Well, now they tell us amortized gain or losses from other comprehensive income with any bond premium, um, like any bond premium or discount. And you're like, well, huh? Okay, so let's just use an example here of what we do in this case. So say company buys security, debt security, it's a debt security, right? A bond, um, in fact, let's just call it a registry, AFS bond, available for sale bond, uh, and it's a 10-year bond. 10-year AFS bond, okay? And uh, let's say they pay, say company buys AFS 10-year bond for uh, $100, okay? And they buy it at face, $100 at face, okay? So when we look at the investment, account, it's sitting there at $100 and it's amortized cost will stay at $100 because we bought it at face, right? So I don't have to deal with worrying about discounted premium in this example. They bought it at face, okay? So what happens then, let's say um, that they uh, are carrying that security uh, as an available for sale security, right? And so, and they bought it for, at face. So they're carrying it at $100, right? Then let's say that the fair market value 
and the fair market value of this thing increases to 110. What should I do? It's still unavailable for sale. Dollar 10 to uh, will go to OCI. I'm going to go ahead and debit the investment for 10, and I'm going to credit the OCI for 10, right? So now that investment's being carried at 110, isn't it? And then I'm going to close my OCI for 10. And I'm going to do what? Credit accumulated OCI for 10. So now my accumulated OCI is showing 10 for that, right? And I've got that sitting in my accumulated OCI at 10. Okay, now what happens? Well, now let's say after five years, I move it to held to maturity. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here and I have the investment at 10, 110 right now, and I've got the AOC up there at 10. Well, what I'll do is I'll take that 10, and if it's been five years, I'll take that 10 and I'll divide it by what? The five years that's left. And so now I will amortize that as though it were a premium over the remaining five years, that's $2 per year. So what I'll do over those remaining years is I'll credit the investment for $2 and I'll debit my OCI for $2. And then of course, I'll close the OCI. So I'll debit accumulated OCI each year for the next five years for two and credit what? Credit the OCI to close it each year for the next, did I say two years for the next five years? And I'll keep doing that for the next five years so that by the time this thing matures, because now I'm treating it as held to maturity, what happens? The AOC is cleared out to zero. The investment is at 100. It matures. I debit the cash that I'm going to get now because this bond has matured and I credit the um, investment for 100. Question? Okay, good. You sure? Because that's a little bit funny. You sure? That's what recordings are for. <laughs> yeah, I hear that all the time, you know, these days. And that's why I keep saying, are you sure? Because here's what happens. You're this close to understanding. And then you go and you start watching, you know, reruns and uh, the news and like, okay and you wake up in the morning you drink some coffee and you get a, you know an argument with your dog and then all of a sudden you come back to this and you're like now i really don't understand it okay so let's look at this one more time i have an investment i paid 100 for it right i'm treating it as an available for sale security if i treat it like an available for sale security and the value of the investment goes up I increase the value of the investment, and that gain is an other comprehensive income gain, isn't it? If it's an available for sale security, I mean, you guys told me that yourself. Yes. So since that's an other comprehensive income item, of course, I got to close it out to accumulate the other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income is like an income statement item. It's reported on the statement of comprehensive income, just like you close out revenue don't you you close out expenses at the end of the year and start back at zero other comprehensive income these unrealized gains and losses are income statement accounts but we don't report them on the income statement proper we report them on something called the statement of comprehensive income right okay but i still got to close it and i close it out to aoc <laughs> aoci not our not our congress person i close it out to accumulated other comprehensive income. And when I do that, now I've got $10 sitting there, right? Let's say I do that the first year. Year one goes by, nothing changes, it stays at 110, year two, year three, year four, year five, 
And in the fifth year, when it has five years left, I say, I'm really going to hold this to maturity. It needs to go to hell to maturity. So I need to, over the next five years, slowly take that out of the accumulated other comprehensive income. How will I do that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to credit the investment for two. I'm going to debit the other comprehensive income for two. But of course, I close other comprehensive income out to AOCI, right? Because I have to close that. It's like any income account. And then over the next five years, I'm going to do what? Two dollars, two dollars. I'll do that same thing. One, two, three, four, five. Five, that's one, two, three, four, five debits that I'm trying to show you there. Now that's zeroed out, isn't it? And over that same time, I sat here and in the investment account, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, that is now showing a hundred and the investment matures. The investment matures, what happens? Since I bought it at base, I'm going to get my hundred bucks back. I'm going to sit there and debit my cash, credit the investment, right? Okay. Okay, good. I think you got it now. All right. Now, let's take a look at um, what happens if we have impairment. Oh, income from investment and debt securities. Right here, all we're talking about is differences between fair value and the carrying value, right? That's what we're talking about here and the impact on the income statement. If it's a trading security or other comprehensive income, if it's an available for sale security, right? Okay. But for all three categories, since it's a debt security, you will still be calculating what? Interest income from that, right? I mean, you're still holding a bond you're still getting periodic interest payments. You're still amortizing any discount or premium associated with that and calculating your uh, interest income. And those always go to what? That goes to the income statement. That is not OCI, regardless of what category. The categories and where we report those or not report them in the case of uh, held in maturity does not obliterate the fact that you still have a debt security that's paying you interest and that interest revenue is reported on the income statement, right? Okay. Okay, good. So let's come over and uh, take a look at and uh, what happens if we have um, impairment, okay? And when we have impairment on the securities right here, Okay, if it's determined that uh, there's impairment, all amounts due principal and interest will not be collected on the debt investment reported amortized costs. The investment should be uh, reported at the pr uh, present value of principal and interest that is expected to be collected. The credit loss that you'll report is the difference between the present value and the amortized cost. Okay, so flashcard that, but let's just take a look at this example right here. Okay, so we have this example and on January 2nd, year three, TGPO company purchased 500,000 for year bond at par with annual interest at 4.25, paid on December 31st year, uh, each year. TGPO classified the investment as held to maturity. At the end of, that's important, you can only do this for held maturity. At the end of the three year, TGPO received the full interest payment of 21,250, but determined that it will only be able to collect 11,500 each year in interest for the remaining three years, along with the face of 500,000. Now, here we go with our present value. Present value of $1, 4.25%, is 0.88262. Since that's a one-time payment, the principal, I use the present value of the dollar table. Remember I told you all the numbers are less than one? And then what? For the present value of the ordinary annuity, they give me 2.76198. And since it's what? It's three payments 
the number is more than one, but it's less than three because I want to get the present value and present value is always less than the future amount, right? So it's got to be less than three, but it's got to be more than one because it's more than one payment. Again, trying to figure out which table you should use, right? Okay, good. Now you come over and they say, okay, if that's the case, then figure out the present value of what you're going to get. And guys, I know I'm going kind of fast, but trust me, the problem said the interest payments are going to be 11.5, get the present value of those. And the principal they said was going to come back to five full 500,000. And so you add those two together and that gives you this four, seven, three, zero, seven, three. The face of the investment is 500,000. Again, they said they bought it at face. So we have a credit loss of 26,927. We'll debit the loss, we'll credit the allowance. That's how you figure out the impairment on a held to maturity security. Okay. Now you come over and um, they tell us um, on the next thing, if it's an available for sale security, what happens, okay? An impairment on available for sale security is accounted for differently than the held to maturity because the investor has the option to sell an available for sale security if the loss on the sale will be less than the expected credit loss. So you're looking and you're saying, well, I've got this expected credit loss, but if I sell the thing now, I'll lose less than the expected credit loss. So let me jettison this thing. Okay. So as a result, the credit loss reported in net income on available for sale security is limited to the amount by which the fair value is below the amortized cost. Any additional losses then would be reported as unrealized loss and other comprehensive income. Now flashcard that, but let's just look at these examples, these scenarios, and I think you'll see um, it's pretty easy, okay? Um, so you come over and let's just go straight to the scenarios, okay? So the amortized cost for the security is what? 500,000, okay? And in scenario one, fair value is what? Fair value is 510. Expected credit loss is what? 26,927. And so you don't have to take an expected credit loss because what? Fair value is more than the carrying amount. And so you don't have to take the expected credit loss there. Okay. Now you will take the gain though. Notice you have the gain. Okay. Now here, they're telling me, okay, amortized cost is five. Fair value is what? 480. Expected credit loss is 26,927. But what? Well, since I can dump that uh, item for what? For a loss of 20,000, I limit my credit loss to that 20,000 at that point in time because why should I report an expected credit loss as though I'm just going to ride this thing into hell? I can sell it now and mitigate my losses for this uh, 20,000. Now, when you get into scenario three, what happens? Well, now scenario three, I've got what? I've got a 50,000 drop here. So now they're telling us, okay, since you would lose 50,000 if you lost it now, if you got rid of it right now, then there is a chance that you probably will go ahead and do what? Go ahead and suffer that credit loss, right? And you still have a remaining 23,073 that you should be taking into your OCI. So when you come down and you look at that journal entry, notice that we do what? We take the credit loss, we take the OCI loss, and then we do what? We set up the allowance for the credit portion and for the what? For the um, portion that was attributed to the, uh, that was left, that was attributed to the fair market value decline, we take that to, and you can again, credit evaluation account or credit it straight to the investment. Okay, all right. Now come over and let's take a look at when you sell the security, okay? And when you sell the security, okay, 
you will debit cash, credit the security, and if you sold it for what? For more than you bought it for, that difference is going to be part of your, and they say IDA, income from discontinued operations. I don't know what the A, anyone know what the A stands for? I have no idea what the A stands for. It's net income. It's on the income statement. I don't know what the hell that's supposed to stand for. It's on the income statement. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and uh, let's take a look at available for sales security. Now, if it's an available for sales security, and um, let's just say that we have an available for sales security. Let's just look at this. We bought it for 100, and let's say it's come up to 10. It came up to 10, okay? Now, what happens? We would have uh, gone through the process where we would have recognized the o, uh, OCI. So sitting in accumulated OCI, is this $10 with me so far? Okay, now what happens? Let's say I sell it. For 115. Let's say I sell that security for 115. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to do what? I'm going to debit cash 115, right? Since I'm selling this thing, I have to do what? I have to debit unrealized gain on available for sale security. This is the U in the mnemonic that we used back in chapter one for 10 right? The available for sale security is going to come out for what? Come out for um, 110, right? Because I want to get rid of that. And then I'm going to have what? 15 that now will become my realized gain. And then of course, I would go ahead and close this account to AOCI by doing what? By debiting AOCI for 10 and crediting what? Unrealized OCI, again, that's for the period. Um, gain for 10. And when I credit that, and when I close that, I debit that. I debit the security for what? I debit the security for 110. The security is gone. And I report that 15 and on the income statement, right? Again, I don't know what the hell IDA is. I report that on the income statement, right? Okay. So notice, guys, if you get a question and they gave you a fact pattern, something like what I said, you bought the security for 100. It now has a value of 110. You sold it for 115. Do you have to go through all this? No. What is the realized gain? No. The realized gain is always, always, always the difference between what? The original cost and what you sold it for, right? Isn't that what happened here? We sold it for 115, the original cost was 100. So the realized gain when you finally dispose of that, when you sell that available for sale security is always the difference between what? What you originally bought it for and the sales price. Okay, question. Okay, guys, we're going to stop there because it's right up on eight o'clock and I think that's a good breaking point because we're going to turn our attention to how do you handle investment in equity securities and we're going to see that there's two methods fair value through net income method, which is basically going to run everything through the income statement and then there's going to be the equity method so that's a pretty good place for us to stop. Um, I generally don't like to stop you in the middle of a module because then you can't 
really finish the module one anyway and feel comfortable. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there and then we'll pick up the discussion next time. So really finish up. Uh, you really need to finish up, I guess, chapter uh, chapter three is what you need to do this weekend. Then we'll pick up here next time. OK. All right, guys, have a good night. I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.